that's it. Let's worship together. Welcome.
morning. Family, friends, and visitors, neighbors. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we hope that you uh, find a blessing here and come and make this your home church. Uh, as we worship together, we pray that the Holy Spirit will infill each one of us his blessing that might be upon each one of us as the word is delivered to us. Welcome to worship.
morning, church family. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. This morning's scripture is Joshua 3, 14 through 17. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage, older and harvest. Yet, as soon as the priests who were carrying the ark reached the Jordan, their feet touched the water's edge. The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zeratan, while the water flowing down to the sea of Arabah, that is, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground, while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Okay. Hey, good morning. So it's kind of interesting as they're coming up there. They were all just kind of moving out on faith, you know, and uh, the waters never actually stopped or receded until the, the priests actually stepped off into the water. So they had to take that first step of faith, you know, and, and then God, this miracle occurred, right? But the, they, had to, they had to make that, that motion, that movement. They had to uh, step out on their faith. And it was... Uh, I don't know, that it's really something that, that, you know, we can carry forward with everything in our life is that, uh, uh, you know, we have these obstacles in front of us, you know, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, a new job, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's the thought of maybe going out and starting your own business, or maybe, you know, maybe you have some pretty serious health concerns, or maybe you have some loved ones that are, uh, you know, maybe they're kind of in a hard spot in life, and that. Uh, you know, it's that journey that, that, that we're on together. But, you know, what is your Jordan this morning? What is it that you need to step forward with? And so just uh, join me in a prayer this morning. And, uh, you know, it's just great to be here. It's great to praise the Lord. And uh, if you would just bow your head. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, uh, we're humbled. You know, we come before you today. Let me just pray for your wisdom and your guidance in all that we do. We just pray, Father, that uh, you would help us. Uh, you know, sometimes our faith seems so small, but yet all it needs to be is a mustard seed. And, uh, and that's all we need. And we just need to step forward. And Father, we just thank you that you're there with us, that you're along with us on that journey. And uh, we just pray for everyone that's here today, whatever their Jordan might be, that you would help them to just step out and uh, to make that first step. And uh, just pray for everybody that's here today. Uh, just uh, may the Lord fill you with peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> Look. 
for you. Um, that I got off from the internet. I'm just going to be honest about that. Let me see if I can get the. There we go. But I, the, first of all, I want to um, give you a Bible text. Um, it says, My children, or in the Bible it said, My son, but it, it goes for daughters too. So, my children, do not forget my law. But let your heart keep my commands and write them on the tablet of your heart. Do you know what that means? That means to remember God's commandments. Remember his laws and keep them in your heart. (coughs) Very important. You know, one of the commandments, the only one of the commandments is about the Sabbath. And that one starts with remember. Remember the Sabbath day. And apparently you guys remember because you're here. That's awesome. So I want to tell you to show you some animals and um, mammals in the ocean that have a really good memory. What is this one? Can you read it? Dolphins. They're so fun. Have you ever watched them at a marine park and see all the tricks that they can do? They're so fun to watch. I just love dolphins. They can do all kinds of tricks. Okay, adults, let's test your memory. Does anybody remember a dolphin show from years ago? Or Flipper. Flipper. Showing your age. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> that was a fun show. Someday maybe you guys can find Flipper somewhere. So each dolphin um, has its own unique whistle sound, which is distinguishable to the other dolphins, which is pretty amazing. Oh, there we go. Whales. Whales is another um, uh, mammal that has a long, long memory. So whales migrate on the same route year after year. And they head south in the winter and uh, for warmer water. And then when it gets cold, they go back north again. And, or vice versa, they go back and forth um, in order to find the best water. So another animal is elephants. Now elephants are really interesting animals. They love their family. They get, they're very caring about their family. And elephants can remember where all the good water holes are. So they have a map in their mind of where all the the water holes are in the area. And they always know where to get water for their loved ones. Another one. This is our dog. That's Tanner. Dogs are very smart too. Tanner knows exactly where the treats are. They're in the garage on top of the freezer. And he, when we go out to the garage, He looks up at the top of the freezer. And he looks at me, and he looks up. He looks at me, and he looks up. Like, giving me the hint. Like, the trees are up there. That's where they are. I know where they're at. But dogs can be really good service dogs, and they assist police officers, and um, they're really good pets, aren't they? They have good memory skills, and certainly one of the most intelligent creatures in the animal kingdom. All right, what's this one? Monkeys are very intelligent. They have very good memories. They can perform lots of tasks, and they can remember signs, and they're able to sort puzzles and sort different things. The rhesus monkey has shown amazing ability to remember what happened the last time they did something. All right, so now we're going to talk about birds. What's this one, ravens? Anybody remember a story about ravens in the Bible? Anyone? There's a, there's a story in the Bible about Elijah, and he was fed by ravens. So ravens can fly a long distance, remembering the routes in the territory they're in and where they've been. 
And um, they can they make different sounds to communicate, and they live 20 to 30 years. So they even can remember people's faces, which is pretty interesting. What's this one? Parrots. Parrots. What do parrots do? Yeah, they can remember words and learn words, and they can talk. And parrots are able to uh, use their words at the appropriate time. One time I was sitting in the waiting room at a glass shop, and I was waiting for my glass piece to be cut, and this parrot was in a cage, and he goes, pay your bill, <laughs> pay your bill. I thought that was pretty cool. I thought, I need him in my office, but I didn't know. So this is one of the smartest birds, and he's a tiny little bird. He's called the Clark's Nutcracker. And he has been found to store food, seeds, in 20,000 different locations. Um, and he can bury up to 100,000 seeds in the forest. And after nine months of time, he can pinpoint back and go back to those places when it gets cold in the winter, he can go back and find those same seeds of where he buried in 20,000 different locations. That's pretty cool. You know, that's pretty amazing because sometimes I can't even remember where I lost my keys or my cell phone. You know, I don't know about you, but I sometimes have a short memory. So who has the worst memory? I don't have the worst memory. So probably one of the the creatures that has the worst memory is a jellyfish. So they just float along and collect their food. But anyway, my point of this story is God wants us to have a good memory, right? He wants us to remember his Bible text. And the best way to do that is just go to your Bible and do your memory verses and try to remember them and keep them in your heart and God will keep you and you'll live long and you'll be a happy life. Thank you for listening.
It's amazing how we all have stories, isn't it? You know, there's, I am sure for many of you, and for all of you young people, for the, the old people amongst us, of which I'm including myself, that, that, that day, that morning, there's something about it that is seared into your mind, isn't it? For me, I remember waking up, it was a school day, I was a freshman in high school at Redwood Adventist Academy, and I, I remember so clearly walking into our living room and seeing my dad sitting on the couch watching the news with his jaw on the ground. And I, I remember clearly stepping in and seeing an image on the television of a plane hitting a tower. And I, I just sort of sat down, I didn't have any real concept of what was happening, the, gra happening, the gravity of the situation, and, and, and my dad didn't really say anything. He was just sort of transfixed by the images that were coming in. I remember my mom being in the kitchen, sort of somewhat haphazardly preparing a meal. And I remember getting to school and, and sitting down in, in physical science class and we just ignored school for the whole day and the news was on as, as information and, and, and just shocking imagery was pouring in. This is a, a day that we'll remember for a long time. I'm a really big podcast fan. I don't know about you. I love podcasts. I've been driving a lot in my time as a pastor. I've had a lot of situations where I've had two or three or more churches under under my supervision, uh, such that it is, um, <laughs> or supposed supervision. And uh, so I, I've developed a real love of podcasts. One of my favorite podcasts is hosted by a famous author named Malcolm Gladwell, if you recognize the name. It's called Revisionist History. And, and he sort of, each episode takes time to sort of reconstruct or deconstruct preconceived notions we have about life and history. He did an episode in, in season three, if you're ever interested in checking it out. It's, it's season three, episode three. It's entitled Free Brian Williams, which is a really, <laughs> for, for any of you, that's like, oh, what's that, what's that about? But in it, he talks about memory. And he specifically talks about the memories that we hold around this date, 9-11. Right after 9-11 happened, there is a field of study in neurology called flashbulb memories. It's sort of like these massive moments in history, the JFK assassination, the Challenger explosion, 9-11, that sort of sear themselves in our consciousness as a people. And so what they did after 9-11 was they, they found out three or 4,000 people just within days of 9-11, and they asked them three questions. Where were you? Who were you with? And, and how did you feel? And they, they recorded all of those answers for these three or 4,000 people. And, and then a year later, they went back to the same people and they asked them the same three questions. Where, where were you? Who were you with? What, what do you remember feeling? And every year, each year, they went back again and again to the same people and, and created this database. And what they discovered from this research as well as others is that about 60% of what people remember during those flashbulb moments is completely false. They, they, they did interviews with people who said, I was, you know, I, I was with my mom and I was, I was watching it this way and I felt this way. And, and a year later they would come back and they would have sworn they were with their father. And they would show them the handwriting of how they, they wrote their story and they would tell them, even seeing their own handwriting, I don't know why I wrote that because I was with my father. So I called my parents, because I told you, I, that's how I remember. I walked into the living room, my, my dad was there, my mom was there, and I remember watching it. I called my parents, I said, Dad, wait, where were you? What, what do you remember? What, tell me, the, lay out the scene. 
And so he told me, oh yeah, I was, you know, I, I was kind of watching, preparing for work. I had the news on the background. All of a sudden I, I saw uh, something going on. And I, I didn't know what was going on. So I, he, he told me, and this is, if you know my dad, Dean, he said, I immediately went to the internet. And I tried to pull up Yahoo News, but uh, like 100 million people were trying to access the website. So I had this clear memory of this buffering website and, and wanted to know what was going on. I said, do you remember, you were watching it with anyone? Do you remember, you know, and he said, no, I was completely by myself. <laughs> okay. He said, yeah, I just went to work and I said, yeah, that's so weird. I remember specifically sitting on the couch and you watching it. I said, no. I, I remember my mom being in the kitchen, sort of absentmindedly preparing breakfast and lunch for us. And so I called my mom and I asked her, hey, where, where were you? Who were you with? And, uh, you know, what, what do you remember feeling? And she said, oh, I was at outdoor school with Redwood. I was in the Med Medicino Woodlands. And, and we had a crank emergency radio. And we had heard... You know, basically over the radio that something had happened and we were desperately, we had no idea what was going on. We were just like in the, in the kitchen up in Mendocino, cranking this radio, trying to get some kind of news. She said, I ran into town to try to buy some kind of like uh, a television with an antenna so we could watch what was going on. Eventually, we, we just came home early because we didn't, we didn't know if we were going to war. We didn't know what was going on. Okay. Clearly, I don't remember anything. Or maybe my parents are just old and they're forgetting. I don't know. <laughs> but isn't that fascinating that, that around this date that is so significant, it is almost sure that what you remember is not quite what happened. Potentially over half of what you remember just came from the evil. Memories of these important events get, get muddled over time. It's just, again and again, the research shows how the, the brain works. To give you a, another kind of sense of how impactful this is, in cases where a convicted individual was exonerated by DNA evidence, 75% of the eyewitnesses in those cases made a mistaken identification. 75%? Our memories just aren't that clear. And so in the, in the failing of memory, we have something that we use to try to cement, to place in concrete the important moments of life. I want to share a video with you of the 9-11 memorial.
We have this memorial. I never had a chance to go to it myself. My my wife was in New York a couple of years ago and told me it was just one of the most sobering environments she had ever been. If, if you go, they, the, 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 the imagery and the, the, the impact that they make of, of the absences where the towers once stood are really disturbing. That, uh, that constantly there is this, this water, this source of life falling. The names of all those who were lost, both in the, the towers as well as the emergency service, men and women who lost their lives, and the passengers on planes, all of them there. Memorials are how we fix in place and time the significant things of life. And as I've been reflecting on that day and, and, and on sort of my feelings around it and, and, and the, the anger and the, the, the doubt and everything that sort of came out of that moment, I got to thinking, how do I remember the things that God has done for me? How, how do we remember the things that, that God has done for us as a church? Joshua is an amazing book. It, it is the story of God delivering on a centuries-old promise. He, he's led them through the wilderness for, for years. He's brought them out of in, uh, slavery in Egypt. God's people have spent sort of 40 years absorbing all that is going on. And now, when you get into the book of Joshua, it's time. God's making it happen. And, and, and the first thing he has to do is he has to lead them across the Jordan River. And, and sometimes you love the way that God operates because, you know, after 40 years, you would think, well, God could wait until the dry season to cross the river. Instead, he waits until the flood season. And he leads them across the Jordan. And we pick up the story in Joshua chapter 3. Verse 11, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe and man. God has relayed his instructions for how they are to cross the Jordan to Joshua. Joshua is now letting the people know, here's the deal. He continues, and when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the ark, and the priests, those bearing the ark, had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarephan. And those flowing down toward the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. I, I really like the detail that Joshua adds in his story. Sometimes when we, we talk about what God does and specifically miracles, it's sort of like hand waving, right? Well, it, and, and, and then there was light. Or, and, and then, you know, living creatures rose up from the earth. But then plants are, you know, then, then they were alive. I, I really like how Joshua like, actually takes us just a bit behind the curtain. That, that God actually physically stopped the water in one place and, and let it run dry in the other. 
I, I find that endlessly fascinating. I think about what it would be like to wake up that morning in Adam. Martha? Have you? Uh, what was it dinner last night? Right? Like, what does it look like when the Jordan River in flood season is piling up? I, I love that detail. And, and there, there, there was a group of people for whom the rest of their life remember that one day they woke up and there was like a mountain of water just standing up right beside their town. And, and however God did it, clearly it didn't destroy the town because we know the name of it. The story got out. So maybe God is maybe keeping the, the floodwaters from rushing into the city. So there's maybe like a, a tower of water there. I don't know if the sides were flat. It's one of those days like, man, there are times, most of my life I wish Facebook didn't exist, but there are times where I wouldn't mind a, seeing that. <laughs> and then there were other people down the river who, who woke up one morning in the middle of flood season and the Jordan was dry. I love the idea that because God did it this way, the timing is unbelievable. Right? Like, like at some point, way before the priests stepped that first toe, as Jim was sharing, into the river, God had actually stopped the water. And he had timed it just so that the, the water, the last like drips of water would pass by as the toe hit the river's edge. <laughs> it, it's, it's such a, I find, I'm, I'm weird, I get it. But I, I love the, the detail of this story, that the scene that is playing out to me is so, it's so rich. So this miraculous thing happens that the children of Israel, they, they, they pass over opposite Jericho. This miracle has occurred. And God continues his plan. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant stood firmly on dry ground. In the midst of the Jordan, all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Everybody's on the other side. The priests are, are standing in the middle of the, the river holding the Ark. Long day for them, one thinks. And God has this extra sort of level to the story when all the nation had finished, we're in chapter 4, passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe and man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodged tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the, the people of Israel, whom he had appointed a man for each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel. I, I like to imagine that these men really got into a good competition. You know, like the, the, the guy from Benjamin goes in and he's like, I, I can't get that stone. And he, he you know, he, he kind of manhandles a stone and he walks out, and the guy from Judah's like, <laughs> Plebeian. And he grabs a man, and there's like this, that's just my head, Jamie, you don't have to agree with that. <laughs> and I like to think that as literally their entire countrymen are watching, they're, these 12 guys, like somebody, somebody sure had eyes too big for their stomach. You know, maybe it was the guy from Reuben, he's the oldest, they're the one, the, the older brother came in, <laughs> check this out. <laughs> Sorry, I got more money. And, and meanwhile, like 200,000 people are watching. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> You know, that one actually looks better. I like the shape of this one, so. <laughs> Go ahead, Tim. I don't know. That's just the way I read this story. So they pick up their stones, and, and, and God very clearly has a plan. It's not for no reason that they're, you know, they're, they're out geocaching or, or hunting for stones. That this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time, what do these stones mean to you? Then 
you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. I, God is so next level. And he, he has this, this beautiful miracle planned out. You know, I, I'm going to stun these people. They, they spent 40 years in the desert. They, they've forgotten what a miracle manna is as it falls. They, they've forgotten how, how cool the pillar of fire was and the, the pillar of cloud. And so now I'm going I'm to show out. I'm going to stop the river in the middle of flood season. They're going to walk across and on dry ground. They're, this is the story that all their parents told them about walking across the Red Sea on dry ground. I'm going to give them the same experience. And in the midst of that, you have to think for God, he's like, these guys are really good at forgetting what I do. <laughs> so I'm just going to bake it in. I'm going to bake it into the miracle. The, the, the priests are going to stay there. Everybody's going to cross. The priests are going to stay there. And then they're going to, I'm going to send guys back with everyone watching to get these stones. And they're going to carry them. And when they arrive at their first Camp in Canton, in the Promised Land, their first day, 500 plus years of, of waiting for, for God to deliver on this promise, and now they're camped there for the first time. I'm going to have them put those stones there. They're, gonna, they're going to remember. And, and, and you love the, the, the intention, God says, that specifically when your children ask you, what, what is this pile of stones about? Tell them what. Tell them what the Lord has done. Memorials are the way that God invites us to remember it. And we actually have some collective memorials that we all sort of partake in. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, when we worship on Sabbath, this is a memorial. We are, we are specifically remembering that we serve a God who loved us so much that he was willing to create us. It, we, we serve a God who desires us. Not because we earned our creation, but just because it was his pleasure. That, that's what the Sabbath is a memorial of. When, when we take communion... Luke 22, verse 19, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of you. When we, when we take communion, we, we are memorial, memorializing the sacrifice of Jesus for us. We, we are remembering that God loves us so much in Christ that our sins were no bar for him opening up. The opportunity for a renewed relationship with them. They are memorials. I was an intern at a church here in Santa Rosa, the Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist Church, actually. Um, in 2009, I was an intern here. I was a student up at Pacific Union College and coming down on the weekdays and on the weekends for you know, meetings and just sort of like part-time pastor stuff. And right as I started that opportunity, thanks by the way, it's worked out so far. <laughs> right as I started that opportunity, I had a friend up in Angwin, where Pacific Union College is, there outside of San Lina, who opened a coffee shop here in town. And it's right on the corner of Old Redwood Highway and Mark West Springs Road. If you ever passed by, you've seen it before. It's, it's bad donkey coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, Brad, you gotta come check it out. So I, I went in and checked it out, and it was great. And the, and the only problem was that, like, a, the cheapest thing in the store was, like, $5, and I was a college student. And so, you know, the, for, for a few weeks I went in, and pretty much every day, because it just so happened to be right on my stop between home and the church. Every day I was in there. Eventually, the, the budget started to get tighter and tighter and tighter. And I remember one morning I woke up, and I, I realized that I had maybe $5.05. And I was like, all right, I need the Lord to make this decision for me. Because, why not? 
So I, I said, all right, Lord, do you want me to stop by Bad Donkey and get the drink? I started to think myself, all right, how can I, how can I ascertain the will of the Lord for this? You know, I need, I need, and so I, I realized I'm going to be driving. So maybe I can have God, you know, show me a a, a car, a vehicle, and and when I see that vehicle, you know, that will be the sign that I am supposed to stop and spend, you know, five of my, you know, five dollars and five cents. That would be my sign. Because I, I can't, it can't just be any car. That would be too easy, right? And I, I can't, it can't be like a Toyota or a Camry. So I, I thought, okay, what is a, what's a car that's rare, but there's still a chance I could see it? And I came out with the sign of the alley. I said, Lord, if you show me an alley between here and the turn, that's the sign that, that you want me to go. <laughs> And so I hop in the cars, and I, I, I will I will testify that I drove slower than I've ever driven in my life. <laughs> and I pulled out of the driveway. I'm looking in every driveway. I'm looking. Oh, that garage door is open. No, nope. you know, I'm looking down every side street. I, I I am like five miles an hour. No hours. No hours. <laughs> Lord, is this really a real crisis of faith going on? And, and, and as I'm just like, you know, excuse me, grandma driving my way through Santa Rosa. I, I, I and, and not seeing any Audis, I got to the last stop. I'm stopped at the corner of Mark West and Old Redwood Highway. I'm thinking, okay, you know, this is the last chance. I'm looking up and down the road. The, the light is, turns green, no Audis. And, and, and suddenly as I'm crossing the intersection, I see in the distance, a light cometh. Four circles right next to each other. The, 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 the heaven has opened. There was a hallelujah chorus, and I was able to pull in. Praise all the sun. And I, I walked in, and right in front of me in line, was a young man I hadn't seen in church in months. And he turned around and said, Oh, what are you doing? I said, Oh, well, the Lord told me to stop here today. <laughs> Deeper than the sign of the Audi ever deserved. <laughs> Start coming back to church. Amen. Amen. I remember getting back in my car thinking, well, hold on a minute. This was this was mostly a joke. I pulled out right in front of me now. Yeah. You know, it sounds strange, but how do you show up in my life at the most opportune time? I, I couldn't tell you the number of times that I have been in my car wrestling with the Lord over a decision or over doubt, over, over just sin or, or anything. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, an Audi flies by me on the highway. I couldn't tell you how many times I've been, I've been coming or going, wondering what God's will was in my life, and suddenly an Audi is there. And then I would tell you that for over a decade now, if I see an Audi, I feel a profound sense of God's pleasure with me. Every time. Every time. One of these days, Pastor Brad's going to show up in like a 2009 Audi. And it's it's going to be a problem. How are you memorializing what God is doing in your life? How do you remember it? It doesn't have to be fancy. I mean, it could be 12 dudes grabbing stones out of a riverbed. It could be a semi-rare model of a vehicle. It could be what? A fan. Absolutely. 
God is doing something significant in your life. He, again and again, God has shown up. And we need to take this simple advice to just make something concrete in our lives, some sign that will bring to remembrance how good he is. So that when our children ask, when we doubt, when we are struggling with whatever it is that life brings at us, what we're doing is we're giving God ammunition to step into our lives in a physical, tangible way. Maybe you need to start journaling. Maybe you need to you start with, with poetry. Maybe you need to pick a song. Maybe you need a, a, a new tradition. Maybe you need a, to drop some, some stones very specifically in your front yard. Maybe, maybe I don't know what you need to do. But God has answered a prayer for you. God has shown up. And do something to create a memorial of his goodness. It, I, I, I feel that it can be true. I mean, look at how it can be done. It doesn't matter. I mean, God made popular the turning foolish things to make the wise seem foolish. Amen. Just do whatever makes sense to you to help you in some way remember what Jesus has been up to in your life. Amen. Let's pray to the Lord. As we remember great loss, as we remember the challenges of the last two decades, Lord, nationally, internationally, personally, as we remember the, 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 the trials of health, finances, relationships, everything. We pray that you would inspire us to remember that you were there through it all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.
burdens that you've laid down today be filled and replaced by the presence of Jesus in your life this week. Happy Saturday. Yes. Yes.